Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Tonight's a little different, uh, maybe out of place. Normally, uh, with the program that we have tonight would be on a first Monday of the month, but our, our regularly scheduled guest for tonight's program couldn't make it, and so I have a great privilege of having a good friend back who happened to be here at EWTN doing some uh, taping. He might talk about that in a moment. Our guest tonight will be Joseph Pierce, former agnostic. I think it's your third or fourth time on the program, right, Joseph? Third, I think. Okay. We're going to run it like an open line, line which means, line, means line. we want to encourage you to start calling us, writing us uh, emails with some questions for Joseph. Uh, a lot of what we'll talk about tonight is the importance of literature and, and uh, in our own spiritual growth and evangelization and, and a lot of issues involved with literature. Uh, but let me give you the phone number so that you can give us a call. 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, 205-271-2980. Or you can send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Joseph Pierce, welcome back to The Journey Home. It's good to be back. You know, I remember the first time, I'm not even sure that I had met you the first time you were on the program before you showed up here. I don't think I had, but I had read your book, and I remember when I read your book that I had to meet you because it had such a big impact, and I mean literary converts. I mean, that book... Um, when did you write that? I mean, that's... Uh, I think it was the second book I wrote, um, and it would have been 1997 or 1998. So it was so about 10 years ago. About now. 10 years ago, yeah, when I was a young man. And it's had a big impact? Yes, it has. In fact, I, I, I was very pleasantly surprised by that book because I thought it, it perhaps had less appeal than, than some of the other books I wrote. But it sort of, it just continues to sell. It's, you know, something like the Tolkien book, because it's Tolkien, sold in large quantities quickly. Um, but Literary Converse just continues to sell year after year after year. And I think probably after Tolkien, Man and Myth, it's probably my best-selling book. Yeah. Well, I think there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about that in a moment. I think there's a reason because it is uh, filling in gaps of our education in a very important way, especially for uh, Catholics. And I think particularly those who are exploring the Catholic Church, who've come from backgrounds that have never heard of these people before, and when they discover their journeys, uh, it's, it's a wonderful aid, aid to, the, to the journey itself. You've been on the program before and shared your journey. Let's give the audience a little five-minute summary to remind them of, of where you came because you weren't always a good Bible-toting Catholic, were you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I have a rather disreputable past. Um, I, I, when I was young, I was uh, a racist. I was a white supremacist. Um, I was also very anti-Catholic and was involved with the, uh, the loyalist paramilitaries in Northern Ireland. Um, and really, in many respects, you couldn't, couldn't imagine someone further from the Catholic Church than, than where I was back in the 1970s when I was a, a teenager. Um, and then, uh, through being introduced to some of these great Catholic writers that I've since uh, written about, mm. um, I started to be intrigued by the Catholic Church, even though I was still opposed to the Catholic Church, but bit by bit by bit getting drawn closer and closer to it. And it's through the reading of, of, of you know, writers such as G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, um, John Henry Newman, mm. um, and some of these great Catholic writers that in the end I found that I, I couldn't actually uh, argue against these positions because they made absolutely logical and theological sense. You know, and I think, I think it's um, Chesterton that says that as soon as you stop fighting against the church, you find yourself being pulled towards it. Mm -hmm. And there was a point at which there was enough good solid evidence for Catholicism that I could no longer fight against it, and then I was just drawn towards it. And I was received into the Catholic Church uh, on St. Joseph's Day 1989, um, which is, you know, the, the defining moment in my life uh, and, and for me that process of enlightenment and healing which led me there is nothing short of miraculous mm -hmm. grace. Because to a certain extent it, your journey in the church wasn't as a response to Catholics coming at you with apologetic presentations no. at all. No. And, and nor were you drawn to a Catholic witness somewhere. No, in fact, the, on the contrary, I was surrounded by people that despised Catholicism, uh, and uh, if anything, the people that I knew in the flesh would have kept me from the church. It was the people that I, that I 
uh, saw in the, the word made flesh, if you like, on the on the printed page, some of these great writers. And you know, some of them, people such as Chesterton, their personality is such that you really feel as if they're coming out of the page and they're physically present in the room <laughs> with you. And really, but in the end, I really felt as if Chesterton was a friend. Now he began, you know, as an enemy, and then he became uh, a friend that I disagreed with. <laughs> and then I began to realize that I'm, I, whenever, whenever I'm disagreeing with him, I'm losing the argument. <laughs> and then he became a friend that I was increasingly agreeing with. And then, you know, once that, that I got interested in Chesterton, then Chesterton's friends became friends of mine, you know, such as Hilaire Belloc. And then people who were friends of Chesterton, uh, like C.S. Lewis, you know. I, when the first time I picked up a C.S. Lewis book, I turned to the index. I'd heard something about C.S. Lewis, and I wasn't really sure. But I turned to the index, say, you know, does he mention Chesterton? <laughs> and it was surprised by joy by C.S. Lewis. And I looked at the index, mentioned Chesterton. I turned to the page, and Lewis is basically talking about how Chesterton was uh, crucial to his own conversion. And what Lewis said about his first reading of Chesterton resonated with the way I felt when I first read Chesterton. So I thought, this C.S. Lewis chap is pretty good. I better start reading him as well. And, and so, it, so it went on and, and say it bit by bit by bit, miraculous grace and, 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 and reason, God-given reason, mm -hmm. those two things coming together, faith and reason, uh, brought me to, to the church, say, in, in St. Joseph's Day, 1989. So the, the wonderful book, Literary Converts, what inspired you to do that book? Well, I think two things. First of all, um, as with my biography of Chesterton, which was my first book, Literary Converts, my second book, um, first of all, it's an act of thanksgiving, hmm. uh, both to God and to these, these great literary converts who had helped me come to the fullness of truth. Um, and secondly, um, a great interest on my part, you know, once you're once you a convert, you know, uh, other converts you find very interesting. How is it other people found the same path from very different backgrounds? You know, all, they say all paths lead to Rome, but they don't all come from the, from the same place. All roads lead to Rome, but some people come from Marxism, some people come from fascism, some people come from Christianity, some people come from neo-paganism or atheism, you know, from science, yep. from, you know, from the arts. So all, all roads lead to Rome, but they come from all four corners of the, of the world. And I was just fascinated by other converts. So these people that brought me to the gates of the church under grace uh, fascinated me, and converts generally fascinated me. And I just wanted to study the whole uh, Catholic literary revival. Your genre that you've focused mostly in your writing uh, is biographies, right? I mean, you've written, let's see, Oscar Wilde, and uh, Chesterton. I'm trying to think of, besides literary converts, who else have you written? I mean, uh, you've got a new one coming out real soon. Yes, yeah, so, uh, my new book's uh, The Quest for Shakespeare, which is a yeah. biographical study of, 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 of William Shakespeare, looking at the evidence for his Catholicism. Um, but uh, I've written biographies of Hilaire Belloc, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, right. right. uh, C.S. Lewis. Yes, uh, that's, right. Yeah. that's right, and I've read all of them, because I, I think well, you're, you. you know, tell the audience, I think you're the, uh, the most enjoyable biography uh, writer, biographer, uh, uh, writing today. Why biographies? Well, uh, I love people. Uh, I find people uh, are fascinating creatures. We're made in the image of God. And when you see these giants that are nonetheless just human beings, I want to know more about them. So first of all, I'm fascinated by them myself. But then, you know, one wants to convey these wonderful people to other people. And that, that's it. I mean, I, I wanted to know Chesterton. You know, how do you know Chesterton? Well, you study him. You study him by writing, reading all the books that, that he wrote, as far as you can, um, reading all the biographies. And of course, when I read the biographies of Chesterton, none of them seemed to really mm. present what I thought was an objective uh, picture of him. They were all sort of seemed to be getting the balance wrong. And so I wanted to say, I, well, don't complain about it. If you think you can do a better job, try it yourself. And that was my first book. And it's the same thing. Often, I think there are injustices done. So Oscar Wilde being now you know, uh, hijacked by the, the gay liberation people as, as, a, as, as an icon of you know, homosexuality, when he called uh, his homosexuality his pathology, his sickness. You know, to me, there are injustices that need to be rectified. And with my new book, Shakespeare, you know, so much nonsense is written about Shakespeare, you know, that really I wanted to get my, my hands dirty in the fray to say, look, this is the evidence. And this is the one thing I would, would say, Marcus, is that all of my books, um, I'm 
endeavoring and aiming to be honest and objectively, factually accurate. Mm. Now, the truth has nothing to fear from the facts. Mm. So I want people, if people can engage me in any of my books and say that there's a fact that I presented in one of my books which is incorrect, I'd be the first to apologize and retract. Mm. You know, I'm not interested in pursuing an agenda at the expense of being factually accurate. I mean, we can't use illegal means to a good end. You know, so truth and fact uh, uh, go hand in hand. So, you know, my book on Shakespeare, I, I believe, shows definitively, objectively, through the facts that Shakespeare was and remained a Catholic until his dying day. And people have to engage those mm -hmm. facts. Because the danger of so many crit critics is reading their own prejudices right. into that. Right. And this kind of gets us into the issue of how do you read a book? And, and there's so many issues here that I want to talk about. I will, before I get to that, though, I wanted to say that one of the reasons I brought up the issue of biography, uh, that's what the Journey Home program is. I mean, uh, you know, one of the reasons we have this program is so those of you who are examining the church or questioning your own, their own faith, where they're coming from, they're hearing the experiences of, of how God has touched people's lives, the facts of that, and how that brought them up into accept uh, and be open to the Catholic Church. Uh, the, the books of biographies of converts has been very popular. Uh, stories, of, I don't know, I mean, dozen of them today, dozens of, of books of biographies. And I think that helps people see on the one hand, you've got the cold facts, the truth of the church, the doctrines, the dogma. You've got the history. But in a sense, history is a biography. Right, right. I mean, we want to know the reality of these truths in the lives of people. Does it really make a difference? Right. And that's what happens when you read the biography. Or, you know, Oscar Wilde. You know, you get a, a surface level of the things that people want you to know or don't want you to know about him. But when you study his life then, you get his perspective on how he dealt right. with the, the struggles right. and the devils in his life. Yeah. So then you can understand his literature. Now let me ask you that question in how to read a book. Is it important to knowing an author to understanding what he writes? absolutely essential uh, and to such a degree that if you don't know anything about the author and you don't know anything about the times and the culture in which he lived and uh, or anything about his beliefs you will invariably misread the book mm. uh, and the problem the problem is with mo the modern academy is that they invariably misread the book and the reason for that is that, that there are three, three, three ways of reading anything um, there's what uh, recreational reading when you read purely for fun and I'm not saying people are, are not allowed to read purely for fun of course they are <laughs> but if you're reading purely for fun you do not have the right you have not earned the right to pontificate about the deeper meanings in the work if you want to know more about the deeper meanings in the work you have to go deeper um, so you put aside the recreational reading you read a book for a second time and there are two ways of reading it there's an objective critical reading where you try to find out as much as you can about the author about his beliefs, about the times in which he lived, about the dominant cultu cultural arguments and discussions that were going on at the time and his place in, in, in those discussions. And once you understand all that, you then know something about him. A work of art is basically a combination of the gift, the grace or the muse, whichever you know, language you want to use, and the personhood of the author. And the work is an incarnation mm. of that relationship between the the grace and the personhood. So if you don't understand the personhood of the author, you will not understand the work. So that's what I call an objective critical reading. And the third reading is what we might call a subjective prejudiced reading. And this is what 90% of the modern academy, particularly in literature, is doing. It's looking at a work of literature narcissistically as, a, as a, an, um, an exercise in prejudice and allowing the work to be a mirror that reflects back to the reader his own prejudices. Thus, you know, that a feminist sees Shakespeare as a, as a, a woman, you know, a <laughs> uh, homosexual sees Shakespeare as a homosexual. The, the reason is they, they haven't done an objective critical reading. They know nothing about Shakespeare or his time or his beliefs or his culture. They've just read into it what they want to see there and it reflects back to them. Yeah, and C.S. Lewis said there were two ways of reading a book. There were the two, two types of people, those who do things to books and those who allow books to do things to them. Mm. Now, if you're reading a book from a prejudiced, subjective perspective, you're doing things to the book, and therefore you're not growing. These people, are these great writers are geniuses, and if we allow our, we, we approach these, these works with humility, we grow into that space. And you know, Shakespeare has things to teach us, but we have to let him teach us. Mm. 
you know, if we're just using it as a mirror to reflect ourselves, we're learning nothing. Given what you said, to what extent has uh, the failures to read correctly kept people out of the church? Oh, e again, emphatically and, in, and indubitably. You know, the, 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 the reason that, 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 that everybody is not a Catholic is because people do not understand the objective reality of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. Now, people are not anti-Catholic uh, at all. Anti-Catholics don't exist. Because when I was an anti-Catholic, um, what the thing that I hated was not the Catholic Church as it is, it was the Catholic Church as I thought her to be, which is not the same thing at all. You know, she was corrupt, she was bigoted, she was, you know, all these things uh, from my own subjective ignorant, because of course I hadn't read uh, mm -hmm. anything by any of the popes, I hadn't read any Thomas Aquinas, I hadn't read the doctors of the church. You know, I knew nothing about the church, but it didn't stop me from having an opinion and passing <laughs> judgment. <laughs> The idea of knowing an author to help you understand the work, as well as, I guess, another way of saying is faith seeking understanding. So you approach a work from the perspective of a solid faith, well formed Catholic faith. Then we can approach a piece of literature, even if it isn't Catholic literature, we can mm -hmm. approach it and find the truth in the midst of that. In fact, I'd like to, to pose a book that I particularly like, uh, written by an author that uh, you did a biography on and talk about the levels, for example, that are in a book. And if you want to take a different book, but I'd like to suggest Four Men. The Four Men by, by, by Heller Belloc. By Heller Belloc. Because you could just read that Absolutely. book as just at a certain level of, two, of four guys walking across the county in England. Right. Literally, that is, exa is exactly what it is. But, you know, the church teaches us that we read scripture on four levels of allegory, three levels of allegory, four levels of meaning, of which three levels are allegorical. So what's true of, of Scripture is true of, uh, of the rest of literature. The reason being, of course, that Bible, the Bible is the archetype and other, other ways of exp expressing uh, ourselves through literature are, are types. So the four men, for instance, you know, that, that they're all actually manifestations of the author himself, Hilaire Belloc. So myself, as the narrator, um, is Belloc. Grizzlebeard is Belloc the historian, Belloc the Catholic, Belloc the sagacious understander of tradition. And then you have the poet, Belloc the poet, who's somewhat more uh, frivolous and, uh, and uh, going places where perhaps Grizzlebeard, his more mature, sagacious self, wouldn't go. And then you have the sailor. Belloc was a sailor, and he, his love of the sea, and his love of adventure, his love of travel, his wanderlust. All of those. So what Belloc does is presents really a, a walk across his beloved Sussex, where he came from, by himself. And if anybody who's gone on a long hike by themselves will know, you have plenty of time to ruminate, pray, and think. And this is Belloc's discussion with himself, the different facets of his own personality as he walks across uh, the county and of Sussex. And knowing Belloc helps you understand his, that book in a way you could never have perceived the meaning of that book if you didn't know Precisely. Belloc. Yeah. But I remember when I read that book, and, and it's a book I, I like, I like, it's one of Belloc's favorites, ones that I like favorite, is that I got, a meaning I got out of that was, on the one hand, we could say, you know, I, I love that book so much that you and I are going to jump on a plane, we're going to go walk across Sussex. But it also told me to appreciate exactly where God has placed you, whether you're in Sussex, or whether you're in South Carolina, or whether you're in Ohio, living in Muskingum County, walking from corner to corner. I mean, that's what Four Men is all about. When I teach that book at Ave Maria University, uh, I talk about the theology of place. You know, mm -hmm. with Belloc, in all of Belloc's works, the theology of place is important, but in the Four Men, it's quintessentially so. You know, that basically, that we are incarnate in a specific time and place, and it's part of God's creation, and it's correct for us to love home. You know, because home with a small h is just a prefigurement of, of home with a big h, which is heaven. So we should love the world in which God has placed us. The world that God's made is good. And the particular part of it which we know best, which is closest to our heart, because it's closest to the hearth of home, should be special to us. And that sort of, that sort of being in touch with the, you know, the soul and the soil being, be, being, uh, being together, this theology of place, I think is very important. And I think in our cosmopolitan, rootless, too hurried, too materialistic world, we lose that sense of place and uh, we need to rediscover it. We can get caught up in the greener grass syndrome. Boy, if I was over there, I could be happy. Right. 
And right. to me, that book was saying, no, it's not over there you're going to be happy. It's yeah. right here. Yeah, exactly. In fact, he even got to the point where in the book, he, he embellishes, he makes up things about his county to make it better than it probably really was. Well, yeah. that's learning to love where you are. Right, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it's a wonderful book. We have our first caller, uh, Marsha from Massachusetts. Hello, Marsha, what's your question for us? Hi, yes, I'm calling about Oscar Wilde. Um, I have long been a fan of his poetry and his writings. And as um, he uh, stated earlier that he's been an icon in the gay community, I would just like if you could expound on his conversion, whether he was a lifelong Catholic or if it, I heard he died on his deathbed and then converted. If you could expound on that. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you. Uh, it's a great question. It gives me a chance to talk on one of my favorite subjects. Um, basically, I wrote my book on Oscar Wilde because it's quite clear that, again, that people that were making of Oscar Wilde, uh, you know, a, a homosexual icon, did not understand Oscar Wilde. Um, so I wrote my book, The Unmasking of Oscar Wilde, to show Oscar Wilde's life. And basically, Oscar Wilde um, was attracted to the Catholic Church. He was born in Ireland, is Irish, but of Protestant parents. And he was attracted to the Catholic Church from a very young age, almost converted as an undergraduate at Trinity College Dublin, and th at several times throughout his life, almost converted again. And then against this uh, spiritual uh, Catholicism, which you see manifested in all of his works, you know, which is why you, you enjoyed uh, reading uh, uh, Oscar Wilde's poetry and, and stories so much, um, is this lower side, this weaker side, and uh, which manifested itself uh, in homosexuality. Now, Oscar Wilde says, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are staring at the stars. Hmm. Um, and he called his homosexuality his pathology, his sickness, uh, and was struggling against it. And when he was received into the Catholic Church on his deathbed, it was re merely the culmination and consummation of a lifelong quest for the peace of Christ that comes through the magisterium of the church. Just the other night on, I forget what channel, um, uh, we watched the family and I watched The Importance of Being Earnest. Mm. It's, it's a fantastically oh, it's created play. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Great sense of humor, very well crafted. That's right. Um, next caller, An Anastasia from Ohio. Hello, what's your question? Uh, yes, I'm a book lover from way back when, and uh, lately when I've become more aware of my faith, I have realized that some of the books that I have have uh, anti-Catholic uh, sentiments in them. Some are literary uh, pieces, and some are religious books, Bibles and so on, with commentaries that are anti-Catholic. I don't know what to do with these books. I used to keep them in case my children had questions and that they would be there in, you know, to read. But now they're grown, and I'm, I'm kind of at a loss as to what to do with these books and how to deal with them. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Yes, well, um, <laughs> th that is a very good question. And let's go back to what we were saying earlier about how to read a book and what a book is. You know, there are some great works of literature written by people who are anti-Catholic, and there are some very bad works of literature written by Catholics. <laughs> uh, the point is that we are, I, I talk, talk about a work of literature being a, a, um, a combination of both the gift and, the, and the, the personhood of the author. Now, some authors are anti-Catholic, but they're greatly gifted. Now, you might think, well, why does God give people these talents just so they can abuse them? And really the way we should look at that is to compare the gift of creativity, the sort of people that write these anti-Catholic books, with the, uh, the gift of life. Now God doesn't remove the gift of life from us the moment that we sin, thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. You know, he, the, the gift is freely given and we can use or abuse that gift. We can, we can throw it to, to, the, to the swine, cast it before sp sp swine, or we can uh, give it back to the giver in, in, in praise, which is what we're called to do. So consequently, you get these great authors who are anti-Catholic that nonetheless have written great works of literature. Um, so we shouldn't be sort of surprised that, you know, that, that good works of literature are not always Catholic because God gives the gift, we are free to use or abuse the gift. Now what should we do with our 
so-called anti-Catholic books. That's a difficult one to answer because you know I need to know which books. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, if something if something is pornographic or satanic, then you know you can get rid of it uh, and get rid of it in such a way that no one else is going to 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 uh, to read it. But if it's uh, something I don't know, something for instance like uh, a novel by George Orwell, like keep the keep the Aspidistra flying, that has a few side swipes at the Catholic Church in it. But actually, what it's saying, what it's doing on the bigger bigger level, is for the most part pretty healthy. He's making questions about materialistic society, about modern society, from a critical perspective, which is actually very helpful and very useful, and which would come to fruition in 1984 on Animal Farm. So you, should you get rid of that book because there are a few jibes at Catholicism in there? No, you shouldn't. But obviously you should be informed about how to respond to those jibes should someone ask you. In fact, I was, my mind is just not working tonight because there's a very a movie just came out with a, written by an anti an atheistic writer that's been very popular that has anti-Catholic elements. I can't, I can't think of the compasses in the title. Oh, uh, the Golden Compass. The Golden Compass, you know. I mean, there's an example of a book. But there, again, if you know the author, you know where he's coming from, and you read the book, then you can right. put two and two together and yeah. weed through and, and understand the book. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that's really an important thing. Not that I'm going to recommend the book. If a person isn't strong enough in their faith, can't deal with that right. kind of challenges to their faith, doesn't know the author. Right. But if you're at that level, you know your faith well, yep. uh, you love literature, you know where the author's coming from, then a book like that can help you understand where they're coming from right. in a way that no other book could. Well, see, what Philip Pullman, who's the author of, the, of that book, is doing, he's responding to C.S. Lewis. He's read C.S. Lewis, and he sees C.S. Lewis as, as, as uh, creating stories that, that give a Christian message, a Christian allegory, and he's creating a, an anti-C.S. Lewis or counter C.S. Lewis using story, the same sort of medium, fairy story, to create an anti-Christian message. Now the point is he had to engage C.S. Lewis to do that and what the real challenge for Catholics is for us to engage Philip Pullman and for some great Catholic writer to go out there and to, to take the ideas that Philip Pullman's got and turn that on its head and come back with a riposte, with a response to Philip Pullman in great creative fiction. That's the answer, not just to burn books. All right, we've got an email. It's going to be a, a good challenge for you. Uh, it comes from Andrew. Gentlemen, you've talked a great deal about Chesterton and other wonderful Catholic writers of the 19th and early 20th century. Are there other writers writing such things today? And if so, do you have any suggestions? Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm asked that question often. And um, the, 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 the first thing I want to say is that my sphere of speciality, my sphere of expertise, if that's the right word, is really 19th and 20th century. And of course now my studies are going back to Shakespeare. So I, but I ba basically start in the 1950s and work backwards. <laughs> I don't start in the 1950s and move forward. So I'm a bit of an old fuddy-duddy. Um, and I'm not necessarily sure that I'm the person to ask about contemporary You focus fiction. on the tried and the true. Exactly. To me, <laughs> a, a, a good wine needs to mature and age. You know? And a good work of literature has to be at least 50 years old. It's, you know, Lord of the Rings is as modern as I get, just about 50 years old. You know, so on saying that, I don't think I'm the best person to ask, but um, there are obviously some, some, some good Catholic writers out there now. Michael D. O'Brien is an obvious one. Ron Hansen's another obvious one. And the other thing I would say is, well, I've sent many manuscripts. Um, I'm not asking for more, by the way. <laughs> really, because I don't have time to read them anyway. But, but you know, but the, it, I'm pleasantly surprised actually at how good many of them are. And I think to a degree, it's just because we're living in a very hostile secular culture where the secular publishing is now out of bounds for Christian authors. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that just in the last four or five years, Catholic publishers, both tried and tested Catholic publishers and new Catholic publishers are now beginning to see the value of publishing Catholic novels. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, I think that maybe the, the, the corner's been turned and I think we will, please God, see more good Catholic fiction been, being written uh, over the next 10 years. And there's that, always that question about to what extent is the connection between evangelization and fiction. Right. I mean, that's a, a, a fine line. If you go back a hundred years, in fact, one of the, the authors that you wrote about in Literary Converts, who wrote Come, uh, Come Rack, Come Rope. Oh, H. Benson. You know, yeah. his novels were very evangelistic, oh, yes. very much in defense of the church, yep. uh, very real about the reality of Catholics and fighting yep. the battles. You know. yep. Slowly, that kind of novel has drifted out of the, right. the genre. 
But let me show, show you how valuable that can be. For instance, th he wrote a novel called Come Rack, Come Rope, right. which brought alive the suffering of you know, England's Catholics for the 150 years of persecution from the 1530s to the 1680s when Catholic priests were hanged, drawn and quartered just for being priests. Um, you know, he brought that, that, that whole period alive in a, in a novel. Now, that novel would have reached many people that would never have picked up a, a work of history. Now, right. And the other thing I want to say, right. th this, this stage, Marcus, is that you know, we live in an age now where people are not taught theology in the secular world. They're not taught philosophy. Therefore, people no longer know how to think objectively, but they still know beauty and they still like a good story. So mm. it, art, music, fiction yeah. is a way to evangelize the culture through the power of beauty and get the truth in through beauty. You know, that's the exact reason when I wrote my novel for my father is because he didn't read nonfiction. Right. I mean, he, he might read a book on archaeology and a little bit right. on history, but he read a novel every day of his life, his whole life. Right. So it's like arrows in a quiver. How do you reach those people? Yeah, you, you need, you you need nonfiction, fiction. you need fiction, you need yep. art, you need music. Absolutely. God has given us all of that Absolutely. because as human beings, we're not just a soul in a body, we're a soul and body. Yes. And so all of us needs to be touched. And to me, you know, I, I get more tears out of reading fiction than I do out of reading nonfiction. Now, I, re I teach, I teach <laughs> Bryce Have You Visited uh, at, you know, at Ave Maria every year in the, in the 20th century class, and I cannot read the conversion scene of Lord Marshmain in front of 25 students without my voice cracking and almost tears coming to my eyes. Now, I try to, I try to sort of nurture this hard, mind, hard man rugby playing image, and then you burst into tears <laughs> reading a novel in front of your students. That, you know, but, but it's the power. It's the power of fiction. Yeah. It's a, I think the book that's done that to me more, as I mentioned to you earlier, is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't think I've ever read that. I've read it a bunch of times, yeah. and every single time I yeah. get choked up yeah. because of the power of a novel that God can reach a great variety of people that otherwise wouldn't be reached. Yep. And so we're encouraging you writers out there to, to hear the Lord calling you. And also for those of you um, that are outside the church, look at Catholic fiction as well as nonfiction. And sometimes you may have to go back a hundred years to read a good book like Come Rack, Come Rope, but there's great stuff out there that God uses to open our hearts to hear the fullness of His truth. Let's take a break. Back just a moment and come back with Joseph for more of your questions. Next time, Robert Evans. Welcome back to The Journey Home. Our guest is, uh, is uh, Joseph Pierce. It's always a pleasure to have you back here. What, what, what were you doing hanging around EWTN uh, <laughs> when, when we found you as a, a replacement guest for The Journey Home? Why were you here? Well, I'm filming a 13-part series on, uh, on Shakespeare's Catholicism uh, based upon my book, The Quest for Shakespeare. So uh, that's what we did. We were here last week doing that, and we're here this week doing that. And that will even involve a little bit of theatrics, right? Oh, we have, we have three very, very good actors uh, who are... Uh, who are bringing the, th the whole thing to life, yeah. The word made flesh, as, as they right. say. Okay, I've got an email here, Joe from California. Dear Joseph, there are some works of literature that have had a profound effect on bringing readers to the truth of Jesus, but they are not in close conformity with the theology of the Roman Catholic Church. Most recently, um, The Shock, that must be the name of a book, I'm not familiar with it, has created enormous waves. Also, the Joshua books as having some similar effect. Do you feel the good done by these books in touching folks is worthy or outweighed by their loose ways with Orthodox teaching? Thank you, Joe. I don't know those books. I've read Joshua books. I, I'm not a real fan of the Joshua books. Ones that come to my mind are The Robe, mm -hmm. a classic American book about the time of Christ. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, but he wasn't a Catholic writer. 
So, well, other obvious ones would be Robert Bolt's A Man Full Seasons, that wonderful yeah. play that was turned into two very good films. Um, uh, and, um, of course, uh, The Song of Bernadette by Franz Werfel. I mean, he, he was a Jew. Um, uh, a marvellous book. But, of course, this is a profoundly Catholic yeah. Uh, novel, even though the, the the author isn't a novel, uh, isn't a Catholic, and that's that's a, in itself is a is a profound paradox that warrants further discussion. But uh, to answer the question in a, in, a, in a more general sense, then certainly we shouldn't not read works of literature because they're not Orthodox Catholicism. As I said earlier, you know, Catholics. I would encourage all Catholics to read 1984 by George Orwell. No, it's, a, it's a profound work of literature which teaches us lessons about the dangers of, of, of uh, centralized power, about the dangers of, of, of the state having too much power over the individual and over the family. And that's a lesson we all need to learn. But George Orwell certainly wasn't a Catholic. Um, as regards maybe Protestant books, I suppose the question would be if, it, if, if agnostics read it and it brings them closer to Christ, it's a good thing. If a Catholic reads it and they're not formed in their faith, uh, so that it confuses them and it leads them away from away from Christ. It's a bad thing. Um, so uh, again, as we say, you, you can't give a blanket uh, ban or a blanket uh, um, endorsement of of, of 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 all books. You have to take each book and indeed each individual reader uh, on on their own merits. When uh, uh, I was I was trained an engineer in undergraduate school, no literary background. And then after my adult conversion back to Christ, went to seminary, and then later becoming a Catholic, all of a sudden I had to fill in a bazillion gaps. And I began reading literature that I'd never been introduced to before. And so I read stuff as an adult a lot of us probably were supposed to read in high school, or maybe I read the cliff notes to get by. But an example of a book that isn't Catholic, and not written by a Catholic author, I don't think, is The Grapes of Wrath. Mm -hmm. When I read that book, I was so moved because I, it helped me feel the impotence of the poor. And no, no book has ever helped right. me feel the impotence right. of the poor. There's an example of a powerful book yep. that touches you in a Christian way, right. not written by a Catholic. No. And see, the point is that the, the truth is out there, and non-Catholics and non-Christians are um, trying to make sense of the truth. Now, the further you are from the truth, the less sense you're going to make of it. But there'd be facets of the truth that emerge in the works of non-Catholics. And saying, George Orwell's book, The Catholic Church is Teaching on Subsidiarity, you know, that's one of the greatest defenses of subsidiarity, is showing what happens when you don't have it. You know, you get dictatorship, you get totalitarianism. Our next caller, Gene from Michigan. Hello, Gene. What's your question? Oh, I wanted to ask Mr. Pierce, what for us who are contemporary Catholics in the era of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. What is the import to us of the question of whether Shakespeare was a Catholic or a Protestant in that terrible Elizabethan time for Catholics? Thank you, Gene. Well, that's, that's a very, very good question. And I really cannot underestimate how important Shakespeare is as a weapon of evangelization. If you can show objectively, factually, indubitably, that Shakespeare was and remained throughout the period he was writing his plays and died a, a believing Catholic, then it forces uh, the academy around the world. Shakespeare is taught all around the world to hundreds of thousands of students every year. It forces them to understand Catholicism, at least up to a point, in order to really get to grips with the plays. So if we can win the argument by, by presenting the facts in a way that, that are ultimately irrefutable, then it forces Catholicism back into the secular academy, at least where literature is concerned. You know, and that's, that's a major victory in, 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 in the, the war of evangelization. So this, this stuff isn't just academic in, in that sense of the word. It's crucial, really, to, to evangelizing our culture and bringing, bringing the world back to Christ. Romeo and Juliet, Montague's Capulets, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Church of England Catholic, Catholicism? Well, they're, they're, we need to be careful. <laughs> we need to be careful. I mean, I think that there certainly is an, an, an element of uh, uh, Shakespeare showing us that this internecine 
feuding and the hatred uh, is a bad thing that needs, that needs resolution. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I, what I don't do in my book is to say that Shakespeare is presenting us with formal allegories, right. because he isn't. But what he is doing is presenting us with um, the issues that faced his time and uh, face all of us at all times. You know, the words of Christ, you know, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, render unto God that which is God, God's. Shakespeare was living in uh, essentially an embryonic secular fundamentalist state where you, uh, it was illegal to be a Catholic, where you were persecuted for being a Catholic. And uh, many of Shakespeare's plays, the, the heroes and heroines are um, uh, conventional Christian uh, virtuous souls practicing Christian virtue. And the villains are almost invariably Machiavellian, um, uh, uh, unprincipled people. They're only interested in, in uh, achieving their end by whatever immoral means. And this, these were the debates that were going on in the Enlightenment, uh, the late Renaissance, when, when Shakespeare was writing. So his real dialectic is between traditional Christian virtue, which are his heroes and his heroines, uh, and um, the new breed mm -hmm. of unprincipled, power hungry, essentially unchristian as well as being anti-Catholic. Um, so in actual fact, this Catholic Shakespeare, I'm going to write a, a, an, an article uh, soon, why Protestants should not be scared of the Catholic Shakespeare. <laughs> because really the dialectic that Shakespeare is dealing with is between uh, uh, Orthodox Christianity and the practice of it and the right to practice it and the cost and dangers and struggles of practicing it against uh, an unprincipled secularism. I know in our day and age, with the rise of secular fundamentalism, you know, Shakespeare speaks more poignantly and potently than, than perhaps ever before. Hmm. And you have that reoccurring theme of people dressing, a woman dressing like a man. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, and you have the whole, you know, the, the liberal perspective that wants to read one thing into that. Right. But then there's the other of the recusants trying to live. Right. You know, in, in a society where sometimes Well, they this have is the perfect example. If you really want to understand what, where Shakespeare's coming from, what Shakespeare's doing, you have to understand who Shakespeare was and the and society and culture and beliefs uh, in which he found himself. You, what you can't do is to do what the, the queer theorists do, and say every time that Shakespeare says that he loves someone, but if it's a man, it must mean he's a homosexual. That's just absurd. Yeah. Right. Got another emailer. This is Vlad from Illinois. Dear Mr. Pierce, how did you come to write about J.R.R. Tolkien, considering that he himself was never known as a great, quote, Catholic writer? He was an apologist or engaged in public commentary on society. Was it through his connection to C.S. Lewis, or was it only as part of a survey of Catholic writers? Also, how do you think he fits in with all the other writers you have written about, considering how different his great literary work is? from what his contemporaries were doing. Vlad, thank you very much for that. That's a very, very good question. Um, the, the key reason I began, I decided to write my book on Tolkien was because when Tolkien won uh, an array of opinion polls in England in 1997, when he emerged the greatest book of the 20th century, it was quite clear that people did not understand the Catholicism of the work. And the one thing I would say to, to Vlad is that, um, uh, that the Lord of the Rings is uh, work of Catholic literature, and it's not just, uh, I'm not the only person saying that, the person who's saying it who's most important, going back to our discussion of the author, J.R.R. Tolkien himself said, and I'm quoting him word for word now, The Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. Um, so this is a great Catholic work of literature, and it was clear that the critics had no idea of this deeper Catholic Christian dimension of the Lord of the Rings. So I was motivated to write my book in order to bring forth mm. that deeper Christian meaning of, of, that, of that wonderful book. All right, thank you. Our next caller, Dario from New York. Hello, Dario, what's your question? Hi, uh, thank God for EWTN. Oh, thank you. Uh, Amen. I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Pierce and yourself, I'm a cradle Catholic and I've always been a Catholic, so I feel that I've been given the gift of faith. My family has been Catholic from I don't know how many thousands of years, but at, <laughs> no, at, any, at any rate, most of the guests you have are highly intelligent people. I want to know, do they make an intellectual decision to enter the Catholic Church before the gift of faith is given to them, or do they feel that faith comes first and then the intellectual 
reason. I'll hang up now and listen to your answer. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your question, Dario. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, when I was first received into the church, I believed that my um, conversion was entirely intellectual. Um, uh, now I know that it wasn't just intellectual, uh, that there was obviously uh, uh, grace pouring into me the whole time um, and emotional aspects to it as well. Um, what I would say is I don't think it's an either-or situation. The Catholic Church teaches fides et ratio, faith and reason, and they are one. Uh, and the more that we have the one, the more that we will have the other. And the more that we lose the one, the more that we'll lose the other. So ultimately, you know, being uh, coming to the Catholic faith through the power of reason, through the power of the intellect, uh, and coming through the power of faith are one and the same thing properly understood. And I didn't understand that when I first became a Catholic. Uh, I'm getting to understand it now thanks to the teaching of the church. <laughs> I want to uh, uh, add to that question because that, it's a great question, Dario. Sometimes I've received emails um, from folk who bemoan the fact that it seems that all the guests are intellectuals, and um, and I think w the way that comes across is that in a program like this, often we're we're looking at what are the things that opened your heart, awakened you, the event, the book, the person, the witness, um, the doctrine, the new information. And so it can, on the surface, appear like it's new information that brought a person home. And sometimes that's true, but I'm wondering sometimes if it doesn't come across as clearly that the only reason that new information made any difference whatsoever was because grace had opened a place in your heart and mind. Well, you mentioned something, Marcus, before the, before the show began about, you know, that I'm, an, I'm a convert from agnosticism and a very anti-Catholic, anti-Christian agnosticism, but I was baptized as an Anglican when I was a baby. Now, we never went to church. There was no prayer life in, in our family. Um, so my Anglicanism was irrelevant to me, but I was baptized. Yeah. And, and, and when you're baptized, you receive an abundance of grace. And that grace was there whether I knew it or whether I cared. <laughs> you know, so uh, of course, you know, I, I now realize that, that it, it was a journey of grace uh, and a journey of faith every single bit as much as it was a journey of the intellect. But uh, as I said, the two aren't in conflict. I don't think we have to choose between which comes first, the chicken or the egg. I mean, yeah. the, the, the two are, are one, properly understood, they're, they're one. In fact, when I think about my own Calvinist background, we had such a strong emphasis on the sovereignty of God and, and the work of grace, and it was nothing that we did, and blah, blah, blah. And there's a truth to that, except that when you're going to go out and evangelize, you, you can't just sit back and say, well, okay, if God wants to convert him, he can do it. Right. You got to give him information. You got to right. share him a witness. You got to love. You got to right. reach out. Right. So it's a both and. Absolutely. And it's the mystery. You know, I know friends that know all the information we know. But for whatever mysterious reason, it hasn't hit them the same way it hit you or hit me. They've got the information. I mean, you know, it, literature scholars out there that have read Shakespeare and read all the same things and it didn't click. Right. There's the mystery of grace. Yeah. And some, it, it, grace is given to us, but we still have to respond. It's not right. just God deciding you're gonna convert or not. It's a relationship. Not to, yeah. You know, God respects our humanity. He's not, we're not just robots. It's a relationship. So God gives us the grace. He wants us and expects us to respond to it. And I, that's why we've talked a lot tonight about literature. Literature is that one of those beautiful tools that God can use in mysterious ways. There have been stories that have been on the journey home when there have been books that people have read and they would say, this is the book that God used to open my heart. And then we have to say, you know, you can't really recommend that book to anybody. <laughs> you know, because normally God doesn't use that book in that way. But for whatever it was, God used that book to open somebody's. Maybe as you were saying, you're reading a decadent book, right. and it was the uh, awareness of the decadence right. that confronts a person. Yep. God uses that. Yep. God can use a whole lot of different things, the beauty of literature. But that's also why we want people to know the author, where's he coming from, yep. so that we can make sure we read it correctly. All right. Let's take another email. Bill from Wisconsin, dear Marcus and guests. You say that Shakespeare was a Catholic. However, he certainly was not overtly Catholic or even Christian in his plays, nor did he ever write a play with any explicitly Christian theme. I think he's got a number of questions here. That's one. Then, other, whether, 
Would you agree there is a cultural bias against explicitly religious literature, especially poetry today? Can one name any explicitly Christian poets since Hopkins? And one sees in guidelines for verse publications the stern warning, quote, no religious poetry, unquote. Why is this so, Bill? Thank you, some good questions. Yes, indeed. Um, well, take the Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Shakespeare one first. Um, we should say, first of all, that uh, if someone was explicitly Catholic in Shakespeare's time, he'd be put in prison. If he was explicitly Catholic and a priest, he'd be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Um, in, other, in other words, brutally executed. There was also very, very strict censorship by the state and um, religious plays about contemporary religious issues, particularly from a Catholic perspective, were banned. So Shakespeare gets around this by setting his plays in two places that are Catholic, the past and overseas, <laughs> most notably Italy. Um, so he can then move in a Catholic milieu without it having the contemporary uh, resonance and, and, and relevance which would have, made, would have had the, the plays banned. His plays, are they explicitly Christian? Well, as I said, they couldn't be explicitly Catholic. Um, so therefore, Shakespeare is very subtle in the way that his Christian, uh, the dimension of his work uh, mm. comes out. But it's there, and certainly I show in my book that it's there, and I'm going to be writing another book uh, when I, I'm going to sh show in the various plays that it's there. So the point is the modern academy would tell us, because they don't, they don't read Shakespeare properly, they don't have Shakespeare's subtlety or his Christianity, um, that Shakespeare doesn't write Christian plays, that's because they misread the plays. Second question, can I name any specifically Catholic Christian poets since Gerard Manny Hopkins? The answer to that is emphatically yes. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, Hilaire Belloc, Alfred Noyes, Siegfried Sassoon, W.H. Auden, T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot, the greatest poet of the 20th century, explicitly uh, Christian to all intents and purposes Catholic. Um, so yes, if you look, actually the greatest poet of the 19th century, in my judgment, Gerard Manley Hopkins, yeah. a Jesuit priest. The greatest poet of the 20th century, not just my judgment, that ge generally would be agreed, I think, uh, is T.S. Eliot, who is you know, profoundly Catholic, although he never f officially uh, became a, a Roman Catholic. Let me ask you about both those two. Is there a sense in which they were appreciated later than in their lifetime? Well, in Hopkins, definitely, because Hopkins actually, none of his poetry was published during his own lifetime. And, um, you know, it was 30 years after his death uh, that his poetry was first published. And then it became really fashionable as being modern, ironically enough. And uh, probably they didn't have time to go into too much detail here now. But it's only modern because... Hopkins put into his poetry the scholastic philosophy of, of, of uh, Duns Scotus, the Franciscan, uh, and also brought back into poetic form the, the Anglo-Saxon uh, alliterative meter and, and those sort of techniques. So he was drawing on tradition, but the world had forgotten about the tradition, so it seemed new to the world. But in Eliot's case, he was very fashionable in his, in his, in his own lifetime. He became uh, very unfashionable when he became a, a Christian. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, even then, his works after his conversion, um, such as Ash Wednesday, um, Murder in the Cathedral, about the murder of uh, St. Thomas Beckett, um, and his masterwork, uh, Four Quartets. Well, as a matter of fact, let's take a moment to, to say something about that book that Tom yeah. Howard has recently written about that. Yeah, we it's a superb book. We uh, at Sapientia Press at Ave Maria University uh, commissioned that. Thomas Howard to write a book on T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, where he goes into depth in these, these, these four, four poems. And the, 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 really, this is the most important Christian poem of the 20th century. Uh, and Thomas Howard brings it, uh, the Christianity out uh, in a really masterful way. And I would really recommend people to get the poem, get the yeah. book. It's called Dove Descending. Um, it's published by Ignatius Press and Sapientia Press, Dove Descending uh, by Thomas Howard. And really, uh, if anybody suggests there's not been great Christian poetry written uh, in the 20th century, read that and you'll see that it simply isn't the case. All right. I'm running out of time because one comment I want to make is I want to challenge somebody out there that really looks for a challenge. You know, we talk about Shakespeare in the end of the 1500s. And we, we hear in English literature Milton and all of that, but what we don't often hear is there were great Catholic writers that left the continent, that went to, went left England, went to the continent and wrote in the late 1500s, 1600s, great writers we know nothing about. Right. 
waiting to be discovered. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and also Richard Crashaw, who we do know, who was an exile and one of the great metaphysical poets, forced into exile from England because of his conversion to Catholicism. That's right. There, you know, that to me is a part of the journey is discovering the great Catholic witnesses that were always there. But often the history we're taught, especially in America, is an Elizabethan slant, right. you know, good Bess, yep. Bloody Mary. Right. Well, we have that whole slant on things. Right. And it shapes the literature that has fed us. And that's why we need to have an, an open mind to the other stuff, that's right. the great stuff that's out there. And we need to be out there fighting for the truth against this, uh, this inheritance of falsehood that, we've, that, we, that we have. All right, Joseph. What Again, what's the name of this book on Shakespeare that's about ready to come out? It's called The Quest for Shakespeare. It's going to be published in April by Ignatius Press. All right, Joseph, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. It is such a pleasure always to have you with us on the program and just to be with you again, my friend. Thank don't, you. Don't see you enough. Thank you for joining us on The Journey Home. Uh, having Joseph here is an encouragement for us to read and to let God inform us and challenge us in recognizing our ignorance sometimes. That sometimes we haven't read as much but we want to listen for his word in those great gifts of liturgy that he's given to us as we go closer to him. God bless you. See you again next week.